Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Artist Space. My name is Harry Buck. I'm assistant curator here, and it's uh, sincerely my pleasure to uh, be introducing tonight's discussion. Uh, we're thrilled to be hosting Martin Beck, Kelly Easterling, and James Voorhees on the occasion of the launch of Martin Beck's new book, An Organized System of Instructions, published by Sternberg Press earlier this year. Uh, this book follows Martin's two-year research-based residency. I believe it's the simplest way to introduce that, though I know it's going to be unpacked in a lot of detail for you tonight, uh, at the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts at Harvard, uh, which was titled Program. We're particularly happy to welcome Martin back to Artist Space, given his similarly engaged history with this institution. Among other activities, Martin participated in the exhibition Macho Man, Tell It To My Heart, collected by Julie Alt in 2013. And he uh, closely advised on the design of the bookstore here when we first opened Artist Space Books and Talks at this address in 2012 contributing an artwork in the form of a dividing wall with stretched cloth panels. Uh, we removed this earlier this year um, <laughs> with Martin's blessing. Uh, but nonetheless, you can still observe the lighter colored floorboards near the bathroom where the wall stood. <laughs> Tonight's program is the first of two book launches at Artist Space this week that coincide with printed Matters New York Art Book Fair. Uh, this weekend, from Friday through Sunday, noon to 6 p.m., we will screen film and video recordings of productions of artist Guy de Quintet's plays from the 1970s and 1980s. In celebration of the book Guy de Quintet, The Complete Plays, which was recently published by Paraguay Press in Paris. A reception with the publishers will be held at 4 p.m. on Friday, so do come if you can. And tonight we have an organized system of instructions for sale by the door. Please feel encouraged to look at it and purchase this wonderful volume. I will pass over now to Jim to introduce tonight's themes and speakers in greater detail. I would like to express our gratitude to Daisy Nam at the Carpenter Center for her help. And I'd like to thank the Friends of Artist Space the Artist Space Program Fund artists, as well as all of you here in the audience tonight for making our programming possible, for which we are so hugely grateful. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Harry. Um, I also just want to thank um, Jamie Stevens and Harry for working with us to have the book launch here in this event. It's been so great working with them. And also before we begin, just there are a number of people who contributed to this publication, including James Goggin of Practice, um, who our, was our designer and is our designer, is the designer at the Carpenter Center um, the entire time that I was there. And it was a real, I think, pleasure to work with him on this book. And as well as I want to thank Keller for contributing um, to the publication. And also in the publication, there's a pretty uh, lengthy interview between Martin and the art historian Alex Kitnick. And I really appreciate all of them. And the last person but, well, for, on the book, but not least, is uh, John Ewing, um, who has edited uh, almost all the publications I've written and everything at, at the Carpenter Center. And of course, Daisy, who keeps everything moving along. Um, so I thought it would be best, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of delve into many of the details um, about the project, which is called Program, which is a two-year exhibition that took place at the Carpenter Center with Martin. Um, and in, we're gonna talk about it in relation to the publication. Um, but as with everything, in order to kind of to try to keep a, I don't know, somewhat of a focus, I thought we would have two objectives. Um, the first is to really parse the project and the publication and the number of different pieces that it has and the complexities and overlaps that it has in relation to, in relation to the Carpenter Center as an institution, in relation to its history, 
in relation to its audiences, um, which we'll get into all of these things. But in the second objective, I thought, would be really to talk about the curatorial methodologies, um, because it was a unique, uh, you called it, Martin, a uh, kind of perfect storm, I think, in some ways. Um, because it was something that was uh, operating in almost real time, but with a kind of, with a, somehow an agreement that the unknown was okay, and that it was really an experimental platform that we were working with. And, um, but in, specifically in relation to the curatorial methodologies, um, I thought we would get into some specifics related to agency and particularly like agency for an artist and this kind of model and for, for, for Martin in, in particular. Um, but we're going we're gonna to construct the conversation around a series of terms um, that we hope will help achieve these objectives. Um, but first, I think it's important for everyone here to, for, to lay out a couple terms and one is institution. Uh, in relation to this project. And for everyone who doesn't know, uh, the Carpenter Center is, uh, was built in 1963. It's the first and only uh, building by Corbusier in North America. It was the, uh, the, real, the outcome of a vision by Harvard that began in the mid-1950s to introduce the study of the visual arts um, into the curriculum. And it was largely constructed without a definitive vision of what that would look like, but knowing that they, Harvard, wanted to equip students um, with the tools to engage and analyze and study their visual environment. And with that in mind, um, the Carpenter Center was born from design and architecture. And Harvard and Boston has a huge concentration of, of, of modernist architecture. Walter Gropius was, uh, for many years, the head of the architecture um, department at Harvard. And um, it, it was Cert as well as uh, uh, Seckler. Why is, what's Seckler's first name? Edward. Yeah, Edward Seckler um, that helped bring Corbusier um, to Harvard um, to design the Carpenter Center. and. So the building as a thing is one component. The other component is a, is a pedagogy. Um, in the 50s, art was not something that was formal, formally taught at Harvard, unlike other schools and even other Ivy League schools. And so introducing the study of, of the arts was largely tied to design intelligence and design thinking. Um, and, and utilizing the visual, equipping students um, with tools to analyze their visual world. Um, so with that said, m the early uh, classes and the early curriculum was really designed toward like, um, Paul Rand was there for a number of years and, and other, uh, other key figures, mostly related to design and, and architecture. And, um, the, the goal of this ultimately was to elevate the study of the arts to be equal to the other studies of the other disciplines at Harvard um, so that materials, light and color were of equal importance um, to the other disciplines that were being taught. So that's the building and the pedagogy. The, the, my role was the first, I was the first John our and Barbara Robinson family director of the Carpenter Center, which wasn't, uh, did not happen until 2013. So 50 years after the Carpenter Center, um, there was a, it was a, a, a institu instituted a director who was exclusively responsible for exhibition and programming. And prior to that, um, the chair who oversaw the, the, the curriculum was responsible for the, the curriculum as well as the, the programming. So with that, um, I, I, I came in with the mandate to um, interweave uh, exhibitions and programs into the curriculum, as well as create, uh, uh, um, I, you know, essentially I think the word we use, a, a, a pulsating in, in, institution. 
And, and I'll turn this over to you then, Martin, because it was only a month after I arrived and after um, admiring his work for so many years um, that I wrote to Martin to come up to see if he would um, want to discuss a long-term project. So. so the second key word then being the invitation, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when Jim first wrote to me, he, I mean, I knew Jim a little, yeah, but not well, and I think Jim, you knew some of my work, yeah, and particularly some of the works that had to do with architectural intervention, like the artist space uh, project that Harry mentioned okay. before, but also the the re-envisioning of Ludlow 38 that I did with Ken Saylor the year, uh, Ludlow 38 uh, with Ken Saylor the year before. And the invitation uh, was uh, sort of like fairly open-minded, but there was one specific uh, element that Jim was thinking about, yeah, as the Carpenter Center had on its exhibition floor a defunct cafe space, yeah, and one of the objectives that he went into with was to revive that whole situation there and create something that's a little more lively and thought of that an artist should take on that role, yeah. And uh, as this invitation, the invitation came, I was sort of uh, wondering what is actually expected, yeah, is without us having ever talked about it before, it's just reading an email and like thinking, oh, do they want me to design a coffee bar, yeah, and then like asking myself, do I want to design a coffee bar, yeah, but then also realizing from the rest of the email, it's, it's really not about a coffee bar, but it is of I think what you worded is something to, to to design a space for the next two years, okay. yeah, and to create like a space in the most open sense possible, yeah. And from there, like the discussion continued. I ended up going up to Cambridge. Uh, we met. We talked about it, and through the discussion, very quickly, it became clear that we had sort of uh, like more things to talk about. Yeah, and more things to talk about in terms of how does an institution actually function, yeah, and what are its components that turn it into an institution. Yeah. And from that, through multiple sort of twists and turns, uh, we decided that the project should sort of be larger than that, yeah, and it should sort of, it should unfold over time, yeah, and it should uh, be something that's less uh, a design intervention, but is more an exhibition that has a, a, an uncertain form, yeah, a form that you don't quite know what it's going to be yet. Yeah. And during that first visit, I also like, came upon, sort of, uh, it was just like standing around in the exhibition office, uh, like over 20 boxes of archival material that were just like resting there uh, in storage. Yeah. And I learned that nobody had really spent serious time with that. Yeah. And through that, like, I, I got curious, yeah, just to also, sort of not knowing much about the Carpenter Center, like to educate myself, yeah. And then, like, I think, like, on the spot, we sort of decided that that should be like a little of a starting point, yeah. And then sort of unfold from there, yeah. I mean, yeah, because the, the, the Carpenter Center as an object, as a thing, as an object of study, is such an appealing because of this rich archive there that had, it was at that time very informally packed inside the offices without much attention had been given at time. So then you have the, 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 the content of, these, of the archive combined with the, just the lure, the lure of the architecture. It, it, is, it is, as I think, a really interesting object of study. And I think that's what transpired for both of us. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it should be said that I'm here this evening to sort of draw you out on these <laughs> topics. Um, but, I, but it has to be, you know, the, the, the book is a, it's a lovely book that avoids so many of the kind of dreaded defaults of the, of the art publication, you know, the sort of uh, uh, catalog essay. And it, it, or it's not in any way mm -hmm. like that kind of an artifact. Um, it is a book, because it has to be a book, because it has to tell this two-year story in a very particular way, um, with other voices and with 
also a lot of the archival artifacts that you found sprinkled throughout with, with, uh, so that the, the reader can discover them in a similar way. They're not, they're not really even framed um, mm -hmm. often. So, so I, I think it, it would be helpful to, to just hear a little bit more about um, so this series of episodes, which mm -hmm. happened over two years, and how, um, yeah, may, maybe just to understand a little bit how they unfolded. You can maybe start with the first one, but, mm -hmm. but I think it could be fun to see also how the archives end up being kind of jagged. You use the word ghosts in, in, the, mm -hmm. uh, in the whole process, so it could be fun to, mm -hmm. since a lot of the images of, yeah. of those episodes are, are mm -hmm. looping. I mean, and then, like, after these conversations about, okay, two-year project, open framework, there's an archive. I spend substantial time with that archive, and uh, in that period, like, decided also to sort of extend an interest I've had for quite a while, which is to test modalities of exhibition forms. Yeah, to think through what actually is an exhibition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like when does an exhibition start? When does it stop? Like, how? What are its components? How does it function on different levels? And uh, sort of the structure then that developed was one that I called episodic, yeah, that uh, it would, over two years, episodes would unfold, yeah, and episodes like in the full gamut of their meaning, like episodes like in television that tell a sequence all the way to episodes in a medical sense, yeah, like a sort of like a fit, an epileptic episode, a breakdown or something, mm -hmm. yeah, and like everything in between, like coherence, sequence, but also breaking apart, yeah. And learning more and more about uh, the history of the Carpenter Center, and specifically about the first, I would say, six, seven years when the institution started to constitute itself. Yeah, because, I mean, that was a fascinating thing yeah. because one had an archive of an institution that was building itself at the time, yeah. The, it was clear, like, the topical references should just be to that period, yeah, not to later period, yeah. And uh, sort of given that I was dealing with, like, a whole institution and not just an exhibition space, yes. yeah, where you would do, like, a contained exhibition, but the whole building and every aspect of the institution would was like generously put to my disposal yeah, yeah. i thought that there should be each episode should have a different structure yeah should have like a different focus a different structure yeah and different focus in the sense that they ended up uh, all addressing various modalities of speech of how the institution speaks to its various constituencies and how through that form of speech it then sort of constitutes itself as an entity. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so the first episode, which was dealing with this kind of bombastic, it was, it was this kind of architectural script, this steel, um, steel cladding of the interior mm -hmm. uh, box gallery. Yeah. Maybe you want to sort of describe that first one. Yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's like, I mean, just to, like, the Carpenters and Exhibition Floor, it used to be designed, like, Corbusier designed it as a huge open space, yeah, yeah which, like, 30, 40 years after, it, the, whoever ran the Carpenters Center at the time thought it was unusable for climate reasons, for, like, light protection, they just, it wasn't, like, a, a sort of a safe environment for valuable artworks, and they put a box in the center of it, yeah, and the architects, they decided to clad that box in uh, steel, yeah, sort of creating almost like a fortress of a box in the middle of Le Corbusier's yeah. space. Yeah. And then maybe you can pick up from there, oh, yeah. Yeah, where we had these discussions about what to do with what that. To do with yeah. it. I mean, the, because I mean, the, the archive photos um, from, like Martin says, particularly like during the first almost 10 years, are so inspiring because they see an institution becoming itself and not understanding really how to perform institutions. So they're taking in, in all sorts of interesting display conventions because one thing I think should be noted about the Carpenter Center is that you can't um, put anything into the concrete floors and you cannot hang anything on the walls. 
So as an institution for displaying art, it inherently it, um, introduces a number of problems because, because you could only actually hang something from the ceiling. And what you saw in the early days was um, just amazing creative interpretation of these limitations um, of exhibition display that could become these, these forms that would hold photographs at an angle or these uh, kind of zigzag different forms or, or large platforms. And the space, the main space was, is about, I would say, 5,000 square feet. Um, that, and it's the, it's the gallery that Corbusier designed as the exhibition space. Uh, there are many parts of the institution that are um, specific for teaching printmaking and studios for artists and also classrooms. But the gallery, is, is, which is currently used, was designed as the gallery. And in the early 2000s, Harvard um, at that time was, uh, Carbon Center was collaborating with the Harvard Art Museum and they built, like Martin said, a box that encloses, becomes, this place is essentially like a white cube, air conditioned, light controlled, um, and on the exterior of that box, within the 5,000 square feet, it was a, a metal cladding that was incredibly um, it seemed very impenetrable visually as well as socially. So it, it contributed to a rather um, uninviting environment. Yeah. And also, for exhibition purposes, it rendered quite a bit of the space practically useless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so then like, the thinking was like, okay, there's challenges with Le Corbusier's original designs. Yeah? And uh, the decision was we need a box. But, but some of these things came because I was complaining about this. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I responded to yeah. what you were like sort of faced with, yeah, and then thought, okay, like if they need a box, yeah, and for some reason they need a box, they need wall space, let's make the box visible, yeah, since it's already there, like make, let's just sort of show what is actually present, yeah, and turn the box that on the inside tries to sort of resemble a white cube into a cube also from the outside, yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, sort of recognizable as what it is, yeah. But maybe it's also important to say that, that even from the very beginning, once you were looking at the archives, the, the work really started in the correspondence between the two of you, that it was already this kind of two-year-long time-released form mm -hmm. that was um, part of a... Um, you were your each other's audience at the mm -hmm. beginning, and then, um, but it, you know, the, 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 there was this first large change to the cladding, which was a big, big change, and then a number of other subtle spins and tints and changes of the air and little gifts and chairs and things that rolled around and um, a number of different. Um, sort of, I would call sort of changes to the, the medium of the space, the, mm -hmm. the, the air of the space, the, um, the sort of surround of the space. Um, and maybe it would be interesting for you to tell us just a little bit more, because some, like, for instance, some, one, one, of the, one of the episodes was a, a gift um, to incoming students mm -hmm. of a DVD of an archival, uh, um, film. Um, another was, uh, well you're not seeing it here, but um, was a um, um, photographs of an exhibition um, which had uh, floral arrangements in it and when you saw this representation of those photographs you also still saw the, the flowers. So mm -hmm. there are these funny ghosts of uh, an institution looking at itself yeah. and and how it was perceived and what it was how it was interacting with the, its audience mm -hmm. and, like the and then interacting again yeah. with those yeah. what those artifacts yeah. yeah yeah like referring to the gift there was like one of the episodes had a few components yeah where in the archive I found this uh, film by filmmaker Robert Fulton, yeah, or references to it, and we looked at it, and it was like a fantastic film made at the Carpenter Center about the Carpenter Center and its usage, yeah, and it's like shot in 1971 and shows sort of like slightly post-hippie students 
utilizing that building in the most adventurous ways, yeah? And like, given that like, today and also probably at that time already, the Carpenter Center was like this icon, yeah? the, the building you can't really touch, you can't like, sort of drill a hole in the wall. Yeah, that kind of usage was like, I thought it was fascinating. And then sort of bringing like, and then the episode involved like uh, screening the film, but also digitizing the film and bringing it back into circulation yeah. and turning it into a welcome gift for new students coming to the Carpenter Center. So they could literally through the film sort of see a certain kind of building usage. Yeah. But it's also like the welcoming gift, that's one modality of how an institution speaks to its constituencies. Yeah? So it's like another one of those like pillars, yeah? mm -hmm. from the architecture to the press release. Or like another episode was I had uh, we made a facsimile of the original press release from 1963 and sent that out uncommented to the Carpenter Center's contemporary press mm -hmm. contacts. Mm -hmm. yeah? and then had it like as a handout uh, in the exhibition as if the Carpenter Center would just have opened, yeah. Mm -hmm. So those were these kinds of ghosts, yeah, that you uh, uh, sort of mentioned, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, maybe we should, we should also talk about this, the, um, the way in which this approach is sort of on the flip side of some dominant habits of mind in culture, certainly some dominant habits of mind in curatorial work and, and mm -hmm. exhibition, um, that in some ways, I mean, at least as um, for someone like me reading your work, what, um, where I see a sort of fellow traveler is that it's about, you know, the, the flip side of those dominant logics that must declare, that must say this is the shape of, this is the object we will, Here's the, um, and that are, because culture are obviously much better at um, pointing to things and calling their name, not very good at describing the relationships between things, mm -hmm. not very good at seeing what things enact, the repertoires that things mm -hmm. engage in, how they exchange, how they exchange potentials. Um, and in every way, these episodes were rehearsing that alternate habit mm -hmm. of mind. Um, which is sort of unfocused eyes, um, and you know, lo looking at both the the objects and their presence, but also the matrix of relationships in which those objects are suspended. Yeah. I mean, I think I think I want to address a little bit more like the audiences, and 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 because um, there's the episodes seem at times to be a bit of a boutique exhibition, one could say, for a very close radiating public, which were the students and the faculty and those repeatedly coming. So this made, the, so referring to going, like the, the idea of the matrix is that one would need to engage with the Carpenter Center on a fairly regular basis to have a sense of what Martin might be, might be doing. And there were a number of, of people that, 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 did, that did that, I think. Um, and, and it was, it was a, the, our attraction, I think, or your attraction to the archive and mine was because there was just a moment where people were using the building without being self-conscious of what they were supposed to do in it. And, and I think like in the 80s and 90s, the building had a number of white walls constructed throughout it, including in many different parts that were turning it in or solidifying it into a white cube. So like these, these archival materials were, sh were like showing us in a way, like this is the possibility. And I, th and I think what Martin was attempting to do was to show these audiences and to show these publics, like this, these are the possibilities for an institution. Um, for the students, for example. Yeah. I mean, but they were also, I mean, that's on the exhibition level yeah. and on the usage level. But for, there was, for example, one episode uh, that uh, was sort of fairly ephemeral yeah, and was addressing more, it's almost like the institution's self consciousness. Yeah? Where, like, going through the archive, uh, I was like going through year by year, and suddenly in 1970, with one exhibition, the archive has attendance sheets in there, yeah, where sort of the 
uh, the guard at the exhibition started to tally how many people came into uh, the exhibition. And of course, for me, the question came up, like, what happened? Yeah, it's like, did they always have attendance sheets and did they just not archive them? Yeah, or did they just start in 1970 with archiving them? Yeah, and in either case, yeah, like the fact if they always had it, they must have felt there's importance to that. Yeah, that, that should go into the historical record. Or they just like started to do that because they came under pressure and had to prove to the larger like Harvard community or administration that there's actually people coming to that uh, to these exhibitions, yeah, and those very sort of ephemeral, sort of almost like meaningless pieces of paper suddenly speak about uh, a total transformation in how an exhibition actually yeah. functions, yeah. But like it's easily possible that there were many other attendance sheets and that they threw them out, yeah. But the way the archive speaks, yeah, it sort of gives you a certain date, yeah, and that date is at the moment when there's sort of, I would say, the first wave of institutional exhaustions mm -hmm. comes in, yeah, where like the first five years have passed, yeah, they did all the big shows, and everyone is a little tired, yeah, and suddenly they measure what is actually happening there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there was there was another episode which. Um, uh, you know, m might be connected also with your um, sort of dialogue with Michael Asher. Um, um, I don't know if this is really the best one, but certainly one that I think of is this sort of peachy colored veil that um, hang hangs, that at one point just sort of changes the, slightly, <laughs> the color and the, um, a feeling of the air in the in that in that space, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, might, that might be you know one way to to draw you out a little bit on on influences from mm -hmm. Michael Asher. Yeah, I mean Asher has been like in my whole sort of artistic coming into myself a huge influence. Yeah, and I was also for quite a few years like in a regular exchange with Michael. Yeah, uh, and is that if what I was, I mean, learning and particularly interested in uh, his practice was like the subtlety with which he was uh, sort of using institutions to speak about themselves, yeah, without him sort of doing that much, yeah. And uh, I mean, there was like the curtain episode, yeah, the one that might be even more obvious is like the, the box episode, mm -hmm. yeah, that mm -hmm. literally sort of. Yeah sort of refers back to almost like the history of my clash or at artist space, yeah, mm -hmm. about the piece he did in 88 that I'd written extensively uh, about, yeah. But so does the curtain episode, yeah. It's just sort of more, I would say, ephemeral in the way and sort of cross connects it with the challenge that even during like the early years of exhibition making, they always had in Corbusier's exhibition space of too much light coming in there, yeah. And the, at the time, they were using like black curtains in, to block out lights in parts, yeah. So that episode, it sort of combined like two things. One was this sort of, sort of creamy pink, uh, sort of see-through silk curtain, yeah. That was very ephemeral, yeah. And then like a vitrine showing an original curriculum document, the first document where they talk about like what that new program of looking at art, making art should do. Yeah. And they talk about sort of sort of that that leisure is actually structured properly, yeah, and that people sort of know how to navigate an increasingly more complex visual world, yeah. And uh, in the episode that was up like for six weeks or mm -hmm. something, uh, the curtain kept moving like through like the hall or like along the walls or the windows of the exhibition floor, like every week being positioned like in a different spot, yeah, mm -hmm. and sort of the curtain is somehow protecting these, doc like exposing these fragile archive documents, protecting them at the same time, but also hiding them, yeah, because from parts of the, the building you could look into the space, mm -hmm. yeah, from the patio up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you couldn't quite see it, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but for you, James, it's sort of uh, all these slight changes to 
tint or pH or um, you know, of, of an institution. They, they, are, they, are, um, uh, they are part of this institution building that you have been writing about. Um, and uh, in the piece that I wrote for this book, there's one of the contemplations on sort of things about a fictional character that you never really see, you never really remember the name of. He was uh, different from you. Not, I'm not okay. talking to describe you, uh, uh, but some, but someone who sort of magically spins the air in an institution, changes the way people are related to each other, breaks the hub and spoke and makes it a network, um, uh, changes the way the glare of the light is, puts people together, changes the smell. Mm -hmm. so, somebody who's somewhere in the background um, is changing the temperament of an organization. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it seems almost like even from your very first request about a coffee bar, that there, that there was a sense of that they were sort of a, moving parts of mm -hmm. people and sentiments and, and temperament that were as important as anything, mm -hmm. um, any artifact or any policy or any relationship to a university yeah. um, that had, you know, and so I wonder if you talk about that. Well, I think, I think it's partially because like the Carpenter Center is, was a beautiful problem for me because it was, it's a rather a very quiet space and, um, and it has great potential. And that's what you, when you walk into the Carpenter Center, you see, you, even if you haven't looked at the archive and you see the messy spaces that were once in there, you can feel something that it has great potential. And so um, for me, thinking like, how can the institution connect with its audience today and, and draw people there repeatedly, like I, I thought like creating a scene became very important for me. And how to create a scene was to, bring people there repeatedly on a more informal basis and try to suppress almost a very formal um, feeling that had, that had come into the building, as many modernist buildings that are made of concrete do. And so one of those ways would be a coffee bar. You, you have um, almost a net. You have like, I love consumer forms. A bookshop is there now, a coffee bar. And how can you inhabit a consumer form in a really interesting way that um, is a net that gets, uh, builds audiences and brings them re there repeatedly for the, for the other programming? Mm -hmm. And so because the building had had a cafe that failed twice, but it was never really integrated into the programming intended mm -hmm. to, I felt as if it was possible to do it um, this time, and but we we failed with the coffee bar, but we succeeded with the bookshop, which Martin was involved in as well. Yeah. So there's one page in the book which kind of dutifully lists all of the episodes in chronological order, with another little column which says, which sort of describes the media. So it actually describes in like old-fashioned way describes the the media that was <laughs> in which the, the object was presented as an art object. Um, but, I, but I wonder how you all respond now to the ways that um, kind of new media theorists are expanding that idea of media to really go back to the older elemental ideas of media as air, water, earth, fire, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. things, that, things that are surrounding. Um, and, and as media theorists a little nervous about that um, expanded repertoire mm -hmm. of thinking. Um, but how do, how do you think about that? How do you, I mean, how do you, you, you obviously are thinking about the word medium as a kind of, and form as a kind of um, a set of unfolding relationships um, that have, that are both matrix and object in equal, um, equal with given equal weight. Um, but how, how do you think about that word medium? I mean, I think about the word medium as form. And in relation to this project, like the exhibition as a form. And so if the exhibition is something that typically has a set of parameters that are usually determined by dates, and there is the, the goal of an exhibition is to connect content or ideas with visiting publics and spectators, but how can you inhabit the known form, the expected form, and, and create something new through the insistence of language to do so? And I think 
over the while working with Martin on this project, I think we eventually um, came to agreement that this was an exhibition, um, and and even like it, it's also often called a residency. But what does that mean? Like he wasn't residing at the Carpenter Center um, for two years, but the residency is also like resources, time, and attention from an institution and stewardship. And so it's like, how do you, you utilize these forms, but um, do it differently? And I think that's, yeah. That's, I don't know if you have something else. Yeah, but also stretch these forms, yeah. And uh, I think that if, if there was one medium that's, that's not listed in there and sort of flows between all of that, I would say it's almost like, I mean, it's not a conventional medium, it's like atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. It's like over the course of two years to to shift the atmosphere, yeah, to mm -hmm. to in almost like insert something like expectancy into the institution, yeah, and create a situation where there's never like a big splash happening, yeah, but there's something changing continuously and very ephemerally sometimes, yeah, and sometimes like very imperceptibly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was also what, what made it difficult for a number of people to, to actually get a hold or a grasp on the project, yeah, because it's, there was never the, the this is it moment, yeah. It was always like sort of coming and going, yeah, but never stopping anywhere, yeah. And in that way, I would say also like challenging like these modalities of exhibition making, yeah, because it's, it's a more fluid uh, situation, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when you and Alex Kidnett talked on in the there's in the dialogue in in the book, um, there's mention of ghosts, and we've talked a little bit about the ghosts um, and the idea of ghosts as you know that the f the f flower that the, f the arrangement of flowers that you see in the photographs, archival photographs, and then the flowers that are somehow standing next to you that you might even smell mm. is thrilling. Um, at the same time, I want to take issue with this word ghosts um, for, for the way in which even the ideas of atmosphere or um, medium as a kind of ephemeral apparatus is, is sometimes been associated with something kind of misty, um, equivocal, uh, if, ephemeral in a way that can't be known, that's somehow unknowable, or, or magic. Um, that it's some kind of illusion or a kind of occult. Um, and I, I would argue that it's the opposite of that, um, that it's uh, absolutely practical, that it is something you, you know how to do, but it's not unknowable. Um, it's something that's almost like the practicalities of a kind of housekeeping or the practicalities of that fictional character that just knows how to mm -hmm. move things and ease things. Um, yeah, but I would sort of like think of atmosphere just as much an as as an aspect of exhibition making as creating like a path through the exhibition. You know? yeah. Because like every exhibition is a control apparatus, yeah. And you control how people enter, you can control how people look. There's things that are up for uh, shifting or so, but there's a basic structure there. Yeah. And it's subtle, yeah. And these things like the smell of the flower, yeah, the, the slightly moving curtain, yeah, they are they are things they do something with the audience in there. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. I suppose what I mean is that you know one doesn't want to say that these that this kind of art is somehow like almost unknowable, but but that it's that it's a delicate and art that anyone can can develop that that mm -hmm. that or that sense of being able to sort of see with half closed eyes another another part of the world um, so to to treat that as something that magic seems wrong somehow you know <laughs> or, or something that is only uh, um, well it's 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 the perfect way of keeping it it's the perfect way of keeping it marginalized and, and instead of it, in, a, in a kind of world that loves declaration and you know you keeping solution, the, keeping the work marginalized. Yeah, or yeah. keeping that habit of mind marginalized mm -hmm. or eclipsed by a more kind of declarative 
habit of mind that culture mm -hmm. often I, I, prefers. I would completely agree if it if it is only those gestures. Yeah, but yeah. each of the episodes they were like hard facts. Exactly. That, that's episode. exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. exactly. Oh, yeah, that yeah. they are. They are. They are absolutely. Um, Practical and uh, uh, and it, 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 by by not no less artful by being practical, but but by practical I mean um, unfolding um, uh, uh, part of the um, part of a kind of encounter that's quite that's quite real and only indeterminate in the fact that it is that it is unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, I think like yeah I, I think. And to add to that, I mean, I think the exhibitions, the, the episodes, while they were made of, most of them were made of objects arranged in the space, they still were um, corresponding with this time-based activity that I was um, in, intent on putting more into the, into the space because they clipped along. The episodes, I think, clipped along to the extent that I remember one summer when I was traveling, we decided to, to do, put one up in July and it, it really, it kind of sent a, a, it, an imbalance among the, the small, s short staff to hustle and to get this thing together because this is what Martin um, wanted, we wanted to do. And, um, and so Martin was a, a introduced to, um, friction behind the scenes, but then as well, like, there was like a, a clip of activity that you had, if you passed it, you might not see it two weeks later, it would be gone. And I think that, that became an object in itself, a fascination that created an atmosphere, is, is right. what you might be talking about. It, it's just the idea that, you know, sometimes if you say something like atmosphere, you say ghost or something, the sense is that that's not explicit, and, that, and it couldn't be more explicit to, to make, to kind of conjure those kinds of, of um, atmospheres mm -hmm. as a, is very practical on some level. <laughs> um, yeah. um, but I think the project lived from that tension, yeah? so sort of from going in two different directions at the same time, into this ghostly direction, and in a sort of bringing out like a history of the institution coming into itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wonder if you, if we, perhaps we should, should we uh, open, open up the yeah. floor. Um, yeah, if anyone just has just a question. Just I, I was thinking about the, the question of duration. And so an exhibition that even though it's changing is ostensibly a single work of two year long length. And that that duration is um, a message to the audience and a, potentially a gift to the audience. In the, way that, in the way I use the word gift because I think of the way that probably one of the single uh, consistent conversations you heard in New York in, let's say, the 90s, early 2000s was the gift that Dia gave by, by granting the audience an extended experience of, of, of a work of art. And so I was just curious whether you talked about um, what message you wanted to give to the audience through this notion of duration, and then whether you, you got any sense of, of that gift being received and, and what, what might have been, whether the audience spoke back at all. That's a good question. Yeah. Maybe you're in a better position to answer that. I, I mean, I, I felt like, I really felt like the work that Martin was doing was, had an extraordinary sense of generosity and to it because of how do you, um, delve into the archive and see what kind of activity was happening and at one point in the history of this building that had solidified into something that wasn't um, all that engaging socially. And, and I, I think that by taking the time and not telling, not telling the audience and the public, but showing them, um, for example, in the in, in, the, in the film that Martin mentioned, an hour-long film that's like this kaleidoscopic um, film of students smoking weed and talking uh, with their student, with their faculty, and it, 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 it moves along so beautifully. 
And so by not only showing that film, but also then packaging it within a DVD that's handed out to every incoming student, it, it's, it's just uh, an oblique way of saying, look, this, this has the possibilities, um, at the, and this building has these possibilities. Whether, and, and I do think like, um, so the other part of the answer to your question would be, yes, I think that, I think that the public in Cambridge, um, being like students and faculty, and, and residents nearby sensed a change in the building and appreciate the, it, it, its um, activity that's happening still there now. Mm. And so, yeah, I think, I think so. I think what's important also is that, like this was, my project wasn't the only thing going on at the Carpenter Center at the no. time, yeah, because uh, Jim programmed the exhibition space for the whole two years and there were like all kinds of other activity and you were like, uh, you took it as your mission to revive yeah. the institution as a whole, yeah? So what my project brought like in the background was a historical perspective of like how the institution came about, yeah? yeah. Giving like these references, like uh, these like pictures of the old west that you see sometimes, these nature pictures, those are from like a teaching collection the yeah. Carpenter Center assembled in the 60s, yeah? And I was like, just wondering, like, why in the 1960s would an art school assemble a teaching collection and include uh, pictures of early explorations into the Southwest, yeah, and sort of put that out as a question, yeah, just by sort of representing them, yeah, it's like, what does that actually do on a pedagogical level, yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you think, Martin, that your project is an example of institutional critique? Um, so that wasn't something that I thought was brought up, or would you describe it as something more akin to institutional care? I like the term institutional care, yeah. I mean, the question came up in the conversation that I had with Alex Kitnick, that's in the book, yeah, and Alex asked explicitly, so is this institutional critique, yeah? And I would say, it is and it isn't, yeah. It certainly is rooted in that tradition, yeah. But it also presents uh, like different things, like the gifting episode, I would say, sort of uh, operates on a different register, yeah. And uh, sort of like the presentation of uh, that collection show operates on a different register, yeah. But it certainly, like, I mean, my artistic socialization comes from a time when like my generation was looking back at institutional critique in the early 90s so I'm indebted to that yeah uh, but I wouldn't say it's sort of like exactly in that register that's classically defined as institutional critique yeah. I would say though also like forms of assembly um, as a way like um, like the critique was in the different ways in which to demonstrate how an audience can address its publics through both like seating arrangements to like press releases to making a wall that's turning a steel wall into a, a white wall that has uh, inherently has possibilities. So it, the critique was almost in like demonstrating expanded ways that an institution can better address its publics. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of like is it a mirroring, showing, like maybe a form of critique mm -hmm. also, yeah, embedded, but uh, not in like, okay, here is the institution, here is the artist, yeah. and I'm going to critique you. Yeah. I'm like uh, the artist who's like, whose job is to, to show what's going wrong, mm -hmm. yeah, but more like also show that interwovenness and show the sort of the complexly layered modalities of speech that structure an institution. Yeah. 
No, I was, I was literally reading every piece of paper that was in there, and for the, for the early years, it was even like a note from the secretary to the director, so-and-so called, please call back, yeah. So, I mean, what do you see here in the slideshow? I just didn't include that because it's, it's like if you project it, it's hardly legible, yeah? so it doesn't make sense as an image, yeah. Uh, but uh, there was a correspondence that Jim and I had, yeah, that took on a very specific form, which was after the first visit, I decided, like, in order just to figure out what I wanted to do, uh, I want a strong partner there. I want, like, I want a real dialogue there. Yeah, yeah. and I, I actually intentionally took up, like, long emails to uh, Martin, giving him the updates on what was happening administratively, because we were changing staff and building new teams and what was happening at, the, uh, at Harvard more expansively in the arts. And so I made it um, part, part of the project, in a way, to just every month or so to really write extensively to you if you weren't visiting, mm -hmm. yeah. And I sent like Jim ir on, irregular, on an irregular basis like uh, PDF documents, yeah, sometimes two pages, sometimes ten mm -hmm. pages that just had like materials, yeah, sort of like sketches, notes to myself, like things I'm looking at, yeah, sometimes having directly to do with the project, sometimes not having to do with the project. And like quotes, yeah. quotes from the archive. Yeah, documents. what I find, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's like a, a body of about, I would say like 300 pages, yeah, mm -hmm. that exists. A little part of it is in the book, yeah, mm -hmm. but not the complete thing, yeah. Oh. So there is a, there's a conversation that's sort of there that happened in that period, yeah. I'm worried, though, that the emails are not going to be archived. Right before I left, Stacy, that was a big thing to try to figure out how Harvard was going to archive these emails because I never did get the right, right answer from So, I mean, that's a problem, right? I mean, there's, there's all this amazing correspondence from 30 or 40 years in the archive at the Carpenter Center, but as you go into the 90s and early 2000s, there aren't that many fo folders at all. And yeah. so there's still activity taking place, but it's not documented because of emails. Yeah, I wonder how it relates. No, I think Martin, you said earlier on that you know the exciting thing about seeing the archive at the start was the institution learning itself. But I wonder what you both think about how that happens in the institutions unlearn themselves and much more, you know, in the in the past ten to fifteen years as we change as institutions. And I think Jim, like you're saying, you know, how how we maybe lose that information as well. Well, I think that's what the, I mean, Martin. You can say, it, but I think the archive, the photo photographs of the installation shots, was an institution becoming more solidly an institution um, because of the number of walls that were being like the car the, the physical architecture of the Carpenter Center on the first floor as well as the third floor where both the exhibitions take place had turned into a, a kind of just labyrinth of, of walls at one point. And so it was an institution in its early days that wasn't quite sure what to do and that's where I think the, the attraction um, for Martin was. But then I think in the, in the 90s you see a more concerted effort to like be a white-walled institution. And so maybe this error is, is one way of like unlearning unlearning how uh, to be institution, I guess, or, yeah. I mean, in one of the episodes, almost towards the end, was uh, a public lecture that I did at the Carpenter Center, yeah, and the lecture was sort of composed of reflections about the project, but, uh, but also that it was trying to sort of address this, like, challenge as an artist being invited into a specific situation and then having to perform, yeah. And I sort of structured the lecture with like lots of quotations from uh, sort of product productivity enhancement manuals from the 70s. And one of the things they talk in there a lot, and a lot of it coming out of like the design world is like, okay, here's a problem. The job is to find a solution, yeah. Uh, but then sort of like going through that, yeah, you sort of realize they, descri they always describe like if there's a problem in an institution, in a company or something, that it, uh, something has changed, yeah, and change causes a problem, 
Yeah? That's how the design world sort of like thought about it, or at least in these manuals. And then I thought like, okay, so my role here as the artist is not to provide a solution for whatever problem an institution might have, but my role as the artist is to create a problem in the institution, yeah, to, to create something where the institution is really challenged, yeah, to, to change, yeah. Uh, and the thing that I would say changed and that like Alex Kitnick in the conversation called like, okay, the, the trace that I really left at the Carpenter Center is like a residency program mm -hmm. called Institution Building that Jim instituted in order to uh, host uh, what yeah. I was doing. Yeah. So Renee Green is, the, is in her second year of this project now. Can I ask you, what, what, am, what ambitions are in your, in your imaginings? Do you think, how, how do you imagine beyond the gallery this art of sort of shifting disposition in an institution? What would you imagine this art, and as rehearsed in this space, inspiring beyond the gallery? I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if I can answer that. I mean, for me, like this was a really, it was like a two-year project. It was sort of a compact project. I wouldn't, there's certain things I can take with. Yeah, but like I would never think of repeating anything like that yeah. in a different situation. Yeah, because all the parameters that uh, sort of constitute it, it they were too specific. Yeah, uh, and of course one can learn from it, but I don't think sort of in a way learn in a way that you can just sort of restart it at a different institution. Yeah, yeah? but but for me I, it's quite different. Um, not the art specifically that you made, but the form. And as a curator, also really um, loving working with artists repeatedly and on a long-term basis and trying to position the institution as something that supports artists, not takes from artists. And so I really hope that it demonstrates how to um, behave as an institution in a very supportive way that allows, still allows that work to touch public's um, in, in, in different creative ways. So Renee Green is doing this and, and, is, and we're supporting her um, through both materials and an honorarium. She's choosing different ways to touch the public, but I think it is a curatorial methodology that maybe can demonstrate that institutions can give more. Um, and could be like a site of production. Yeah, yeah. exactly, oh. yeah. Can you start again? Um, hello. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on the term or the idea that the institution speaks. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting signifier to use when it comes to an institution. Um, because an ins I don't think of an institution as having agency. We are the institution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it maybe has more to do with writing, but I just wanted to know what, what you're thinking when you use that term, mm -hmm. the institution speaks. Thank it, you. Yeah, it's like all the episodes, there were like 10 all together. Each of them tried to inhabit like a sort of a different site, how the institution, what I called like speak or could say communicates. Yeah, so it started like, with the building, yeah, the building makes a statement, yeah, then continued with the press release, yeah, there's like something being sent out, then it continued with an online slideshow, uh, which is an online presence, yeah, continued on uh, with like a, a lecture, the artist talk is something, uh, the project ended with a traditional exhibition, yeah, the exhibition as another modality of like putting something forward. Uh, how the institution, giving a gift to the students, yeah. The institution speaks to the students and welcomes them the in, tables and yeah. chairs, like yeah. assembly. Like give it, putting in like a seating arrangement in a certain area, yeah. So that's what I meant with like f modalities of speech of the institution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I, can, I, can I ask a question? I, I'm interested 
as you uh, spent two years working so in depth on this project, um, can you talk a little bit about closure? Maybe to round off the evening, just I'm, like, how, did, how do you end it? How do you step away from this? I'm also interested in the fact that, Jim, you also moved on uh, to a different institution. Mm -hmm. So how does that affect, or like, what, 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 was there a form of closure there, or like, what was it about keeping things open? Um, I mean, I think closure, I can't see like closure on, on a friendship and working maybe t together again, but the book is one thing of like, it was really important to see um, the book through over the past year, even though I wasn't with the Carpenter Center, and to ensure that it was done within a, the vision that Martin and wanted, as well as that we thought appropriate. So I think, I mean, the book actually re really represents um, the material evidence of a lot of em, em, uh, ephemeral activity. And, um, and I think that in terms of the project, it cr creates, I hope, a, a, a nice closure in that way. I don't know, Martin, if you have yeah. something else to say. I mean, in terms of the episodes, like the last two episodes sort of tried to produce closure also. It was like the sec uh, the penultimate one was like the artist talk, yeah, yeah, where after like not residing at the Carpenters Center, suddenly I was like standing there at Harvard giving a lecture yeah, in the Corbusier design lecture room, yeah. And the ultimate episode was an exhibition of these images of explorations in uh, the Southwest in the 19th century, yeah, sort of using these forms towards the end. And there was always clear, like if it ends, that should be sort of we go back to mm -hmm. sort of the convention of what a, an exhibiting institution yeah. does, yeah. With set dates and it, yeah. yeah. Beginning and end times, yeah, labels, yeah, everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Martin finally gave them what they wanted at the end, which was an exhibition. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they're amazing. <laughs> That's not true. Also, yeah, it's, I wanted to see them myself. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you. There's thank you to Jim, Martin, and Karen. Yeah.